Hey, how's it going? It's Elge from Simple Lines Anatomy. This is our first video ever. We've been getting lots of requests on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter uh, to start doing this, and we thought we'd finally get around to it. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the hands-on-knees recovery posture versus the hands-on-head recovery posture. So if you can see my setup here, I've just got Sketchbook Pro. It's an app uh, we use for some of our illustrations. Uh, that you may have seen again on our social media posts and it's a good one we're certainly not sponsored by them if they wanted to give us a bunch of money for doing this um, yeah we'd be totally for that because we're broke in any case um, you can see I've just got my pens and my color and my layers all set up here and I'm gonna be shifting back and forth uh, with that as we go so I've got some setup here, but the first thing I wanted to introduce is just where this all started. Um, there was a post recently, a, a tweet, uh, by Max Gubby, who said, I demand a public apology from every coach I've ever had, which is both funny and it's kind of telling of, uh, of how there's some misconceptions in the sports world uh, in these different recovery postures we're going to talk about today. And so this was a, a study. I'm just going to pull that up. This was a study by all these people, Michelson, Brilla, Suprak, McLaughlin, Dockwist, and Dylan T. Uh, none of this at L stuff. Anyways, it was called Effects of Two Different Recovery Postures During High Intensity Interval Training. Uh, th and this is important because, you know, recovery is always huge in sports. They found that the hands on knees posture was superior, heart rate recovery, tidal volume, of lungs basically your recovery overall is faster after high intensity training and it's better than the hands on head posture uh, for that recovery so you can see the setup on here I've kind of outlined a few of the things we're going to be talking about the biomechanics of why one posture is is superior to another and really they're quite simple you know this this may look complex but I'm going to guide you through the anatomical reasons for this and why this actually happens in the way it does. Uh, one of the things we have to address though is some of the reason why the hands above the head posture is thought to be superior or has been told to be superior because it has a stronger look to it. It, it doesn't look as weak, whereas the hands on knees is said to be a weak looking posture. And so that's part of the psychology, that's part of the psychology of sports and just how we do physical activity. But it is kind of telling you how we recover, how the body wants to recover. And this is not something we should necessarily ignore. In any case, we're gonna explain these biomechanics and hopefully you'll be able to make uh, just as much sense of it as we have. So what we need to skip to first is really the lungs, if you really wanna understand why this is the case. So this is just a cut. It's actually from our app, Simple Lines Anatomy, by the same name. And this is a cut of the thorax. Here's the rib cage. Oops, sorry, pardon me. Here's the rib cage. There we go. Sternum, lumbar spine, sacrum, all that stuff. We don't really need any of that today. We're more concerned with the ribs, which are these guys here. So just on the inside of the ribs, we have a set of lungs. Hopefully I have a set of lungs. Otherwise, you know, you got trouble. In any case, it's the lungs on one side and there's the lungs on the other side. Nice cardiac notch for you and then a trachea going up. Not super important, we know that. But here's the thing, those lungs inside the rib cage, they actually have a double layered system. And these are called the pleura or pleuras. Uh, in any case, they surround the lungs. There's one layer called the visceral pleura. Viscera just means organ. And they wrap the lung uh, close to the tissue itself. I'm just gonna draw one side, it's easier. So there would be no gaps in between this. It would be the same continuous tissue. And then on the outside of that, we'll just make it green, it's not that color at all, uh, is the parietal pleura, and that's attached to the ribcage. So one is right on the organ, it is the organ essentially, and then the other is on the inner surface of the ribcage. So they are separate, uh, but at the same time, they have a fluid layer what we call a pleural fluid. Many organs have this same setup, the heart and even the, the guts, those viscera, they also have this same setup. So there's fluid between the lungs and between the rib cage. And what this does is it actually sort of vacuum seals one to the other. It makes it 
slippable. It makes it slide a little bit back and forth, which is good. That's that's most definitely what we want. Um, but at the same time, it makes it so that the lungs will move along with the ribs. This is hugely important. If we lose the vacuum seal, basically the lungs would collapse in you on, on you. They would all drop this way and it'd get to be about the size of the fist, which is too small to be functional. This is serious problem. So we don't want that. So that fluid prevents that from happening. And it makes it so that the rib cage and even the diaphragm below, which is a muscle we will definitely be talking about today, which is right about there, can pull effectively on the lungs. And so therefore we can say rib motion and diaphragm motion is lung motion. They are one and the same. There's of course some chemical processes going on that are essential to making sure that this happens in the right way. But certainly musculoskeletal motion here, MSK, that does have a big function um, in regards to how those lungs will work effectively. So one posture versus another, even though it seems unrelated to gas exchange, it very much is because there's a mechanical component to all this. We need both inhalation and we need exhalation. They're, they're really uh, both equally important. And when it comes down to it, we need to get, after high intensity training, we need to get more O2, those are oxygen moles, in, and we need to get more CO2 out. So carbon dioxide there, CO2, O2. Those are really, really important things. If we don't have that happening, then we will prolong our recovery period. This means we've got to spend more time in a heavy breathing state and we won't get our energy back as quickly. This is common knowledge, but just in case you don't know, O2 is a basic energy component for pretty much every cell in the body. It's one of them anyways, not the sole one, but it's definitely one of them. And then CO2, carbon dioxide, is the waste product for the body when that O2 is processed into a fuel. And so it, this means that if I don't get the O2 back, I'm gonna be low energy for a long period of time. And if I don't eliminate CO2, I stay in a faster breathing weight or even a slightly more acidic state for a longer period of time. Too much CO2, I breathe faster. The faster we can get our athletes to recover or just you as an athlete after high intensity intervals, whether that's you know a period in a game or you know uh, during the middle of a game, um, uh, or even over a long season, the faster we can get athletes to recover, the better their performance will be. Weakness and appearance aside, that's that's unrelated. Performance, you know, that's what matters at the end of the day. So again, lung motion is rib motion, is respiratory diaphragm motion. This is really important. So we're going to start by looking at the hands on head. Again, this is the posture that was thought to be superior. Um, for you know some some reasons that were semi-valid, but ultimately you know proved to be not yeah don't say not nearly as valid. So right away you'll notice the hands above the head posture. We've got this big overall extension going on. So I'm just going to draw on the spine just quite simply as well. You can see there's a round this way. I'm I'm generalizing, but we've got this kind of big round, bigger brush for that big round, and we call that spinal extension. It's generally going forward or pushing forward. So already we've elongated the trunk quite significantly. And that, that is good because it draws the spaces apart. And this will be this will be a big thing. We want to get things up, especially for inhalation. And, and that's what this definitely does. So just to go back to our rib picture, you will hopefully notice that um, these ribs again, creating lung motion. They want to move in a certain way, and the sternum wants to move in a certain way, and the diaphragm wants to move in a certain way. So let's just talk about inhalation first. When the ribs inhale, the top parts go up, and you could call that pump handle motion, that's fine. And the lower parts, as we get lower, they do a bucket handle motion, but they come out to the side, they, they expand laterally. Um, just going from the side, this is just another view, they go up, and then they come out, they kind of come out, expand that way. It's again, bucket handle if you want to get technical, but for today, we don't need to worry about that. So overall, we want, we actually want a big expansion of the lungs. When this happens, when we increase the size of the thorax, as, as we're doing here, or we really increase the size of the whole trunk, uh, we're creating a bigger plus here, bigger space here, and this will help to draw air in. So this will get more air in through the mouth. O2, which is good. Again, that's this is okay. We want this. 
Um, it's not perfect in this position, but we, we are getting some of that. So this is good. Now, conversely, we're also, or we also want in this position, the respiratory diaphragm to act well. So this respiratory diaphragm, that's our main breathing muscle. It can even, it works even in quiet breath. Um, and it's kind of got this like 45 degree down thing going on. I could summarize, we get rid of that. I could summarize and say it's kind of like that, but it splits the body in half and it goes, uh, you know, xiphoid process, along the inside of the ribs and it goes down and attaches to about L2. Again, summarized like 45 degree down, but it has this dome shape to it. If we're looking at it right from the middle, it's more like this, right in the middle. So same thing here, this is just a front view and this is more of a side view. So when it, when we inhale and we contract this muscle, what it does is drop straight down. So I'm gonna do that just in blue here. So it would drop straight down. So the dome would flatten out. And it's not just a straight down flatten, it's actually more of a 45 degree thing going on. I could make a better arrow, there we go, 45 going on. And again, this lengthens all right, the space. It lengthens the thoracic cage or it lengthens the cavity. It will press down on the guts too, that's gonna come up again as we get into this, but we'll, it will press down on the guts, make a bigger space, and overall we're gonna get a bigger inhalation. And that is essentially what's happening here uh, when we assume this posture initially. So this is a little more of a simplified picture, and there's that respiratory diaphragm again. So based on the fact that we are separating the upper from the lower, we get an overall downward pull. So again, we should get more of a thoracic cage opening, increase in size, and therefore a pulling in of the O2. Another thing we do get too, which is, which is kind of neat, we've got some important muscles. Um, let me just erase part of this spine part there. There we go. Anyways, we've got some important muscles that actually go from arm to rib cage. Uh, two of which are, are really, really simple. We're gonna go after the pecs. Um, so pec minor, for instance, comes from coracoid process. It's not in this picture. It goes roughly ribs three to five. So kind of like that. One, two, three. And that's good. So it goes from the scapula coracoid process and it's going to the ribs. So as I bring my arms up, as I lift my arms this way, it's pulling those ribs up with them. So we're getting a pull upward. Remember again, we want that because we've got to lift those ribs and increase the space there. This is a good thing for inhalation. Same thing with pec major. Let's do that in yellow. That goes from the, the true arm, humerus, and it attaches really to most of the ribs. You know, one to six, one to seven, the sternum and the costal chondral cartilages. Um, you know, the, there's a bit of variance in, in every human. So not a big deal. We, we can be off by a segment or two. In any case, this will as well lift the sternum, lift the ribs up, increasing the thoracic cavity. Uh, there's a third one we could add, the serratus anterior. It's coming from the scapula. You can't even see it in this picture, but it's going around like that, roughly, something like so. And so that will give you uh, the uh, lifting of the ribs as well from the back. But that, that one's, you know, a little less, so it's not nearly as obvious, and most people don't know what the serratus is. So that's cool. Medial border of the scapula, ribs one to eight, one to nine. Again, off by a segment. So we've got this posture, which is definitely pulling the ribs up and it is definitely increasing the distance between the pelvis and the thorax. And we're getting a general pull down of the diaphragm. This will, will do good for inhalation. The problem with it is that it doesn't do much in the way of exhalation. It is favoring inhalation. But when you want to go into the reverse position that should do all the reverse mechanics, we don't get that nearly as much. It's not nearly as effective as doing that. So we end up in a position that we can inhale in, but we can't exhale. So therefore we can't expel CO2 very well. And that's just the other side of the coin. We, we need both. So we need a posture that can do that. And that's really the hands on knees. It doesn't look as effective in inhalation, but in some ways it very much is. Now the problem with the hands on head posture, it's kind of like having a race car, like an F1 race or an ass car, whatever you like. Um, that can only accelerate, it can only go faster. Let's say it only has gas pedal. It does one thing really, really well. But the problem is, uh, once you hit a corner, you really need that break. You need to do both things. You need to accelerate, you need to slow down. So we have that in the hands on knees posture. It does both and it does both pretty well. So simple explanation, or looking at this as simple, you can tell the big difference is simply that 
the hands are on the knees, but that means something else. That means that the arms here are supporting some of that trunk weight. You'll notice in the other posture that uh, we have all of our weight essentially it would be on the spine because we've pushed back we, as a whole. We're in our backwards position, our spinal extension. Therefore, all of the weight is falling on the spine and it's on the back of the spine, which you know isn't wrong. You can do that just fine. But in this case, we've got arms going. Now you can't see both arms here, but basically we're creating a tripod position because we've got one arm, two arms, left and right. And then we've got the spine also carrying some of the weight, all three of those things. So it's a more stable base just to begin with, which is just good. That's definitely what we want. Um, one thing I want to say, I'm going to explain what it does to the spine, which is very good. But with the arms, you'll notice as we push our body weight down, the shoulders will pop up a bit. So we get some of the same uh, attachments, the pecs, muscles, pecs, and, and the serratus too. But we get some of the pecs pulling up on those ribs. So we do get some of the effect, just some of the effect that we get the hands on head posture here with the muscular pull of the ribs. But we also get some of the freedom of the spine that we need to go into exhalation to. So right off the bat, we do get a little bit of muscular pull into the upper ribs through the pecs. Now, here's the same thing. Um, the, the big important thing here uh, is that the spinal extensor muscles, what we call like the erector spinae or some of the deep intrinsics, because the arms are taking that weight, we actually don't need nearly as much contraction. So we can have just a little bit of spinal contraction doing our supporting. Whereas in, you'll notice the hands above the head posture, because we've got this big extension, we need a lot more spinal power to hold this in place. They're called spinal extensors because they do extension. So if you're holding yourself in extended position, those muscles will have to work a lot harder. The thing about the spine, well, there's a lot of things about the spine, but anyways, this is a simple, really, really simplified view. The thing about the spine is that every rib, and this is a rib right here in blue, pardon me one second, rib right here, rib in blue, and these are vertebrae there, each rib, from most of the ribs anyways, two, definitely all the way down to nine. Uh, ribs two to nine, you have 12 on each side, so that's a good proportion. They attach to two vertebrae each. Again, the vast majority of them do that. They are wedged in between the vertebrae. So we're looking at a kind of a side view and the rib head here will attach to two vertebrae. When we have less muscular contraction, we've got a lighter muscle here, we don't have as much restriction in vertebrae. So those vertebrae are a lot freer to move. And because there's some strong ligaments, which I'll just do here in green, between the ribs and vertebrae, it means that when the vertebrae are freer to move, so is the rib. Again, they're attached. There's strong ligaments in between them. There's like a radiate ligament, costal transverse ligament, to get technical. In any case, this is a, this is a start. So the rib cage should overall be freer to move into inhalation and exhalation. And this is all very good, but it does get better than that. So what we start to get um, when we free up the spine too, is we almost get this like swinging motion. So the body starts to swing back and forth. So we get this, this uh, back and, and forward motion on inhalation, exhalation. And I'm just going to go to my more simplified pictures. I've just eliminated the arms. So you'll notice we've got hands on knees, H-O-K, flexion and hands on knees, extension over here. So you can see in the flexion, I'm swinging backwards, what we call flexion, and my head would be dropping forward just a little bit, doesn't have to be a ton. Uh, I've exaggerated it here for sure. And then in the extended or inhalation picture, I'm swinging forwards and my head is kind of coming up and forwards at the same time. These are really, really important because we're mimicking uh, some of the uh, postures and mimicking, exaggerating really, we're exaggerating some of the mechanics of breathing by doing so. Remember, this is really important, these are recovery breaths. You would never do this normally, this would be after high intensity physical exertion. So this would not be something you would ever want to do um, if you just got up out of the chair. In fact, if you get up out of the chair and you're breathing like this, you, you've got a big problem. You know, this is not a, this is, this is not something you'd ever want to see in, in just the average person. This is after sports. This is after, you know, um, something that, uh, that really means something physically. 
So that spine going up and down, we get from that, we get big changes in trunk length. So this is dropping down here. And much like the hands above the head, we actually get a, a raising up going into spinal extension. And so this allows us to kind of maximize our respiration. A lot of sports is about maximizing everything. That's power output. But if we can maximize recovery too, that's a huge thing. Again, it means overall your athlete's performance or you, the athlete, will perform better throughout the game and throughout a series of games, you know, about, through the whole season. So this is a this is a really really good thing. Anyways, maximizing. Remember that the diaphragm's right about there, so we're we're squishing and squashing it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the abdominal muscles too. So when we get that big rib motion, remember that we have some guts below. I'm just going to do a little bit of a circle here, just to explain. Just I'm going to keep it real simple. You could you could name these, you know, liver and stomach and spleen and intestines. That's good. But I'm just going to draw just a little bit of a pink circle. So when I drop down here, notice that my diaphragm is overlaying these these organs, and this is you know on purpose. The diaphragm in respiration, one of its main jobs is to create a, a pressure pump, not only to draw air in, not only to create a vacuum, but to actually pressurize the guts and help with fluid return throughout the system. This is a really big thing. And conversely, when I go into, you know, more of an extension, I get the opposite effect. I get fluid influx and then, you know, compression on and off. It's, it's called like massaging the viscera. And this is a really important thing, uh, especially in the low pressure system of the gut. Totally different topic. Don't even worry about that. Now, uh, another really important part of this is that the abdominal muscles, so that whether that's like rectus abdominis or the obliques, rectus abdominis being roughly there, the obliques being roughly that way, I'm gonna just eliminate that, um, they are in a way postural muscles. You know, the ab muscles, well, they look great too, but also they are they are definitely postural muscles. They have a, a big effect on uh, elimination, whether that's the bowels or the bladder, but generally they hold the guts in place and keep the trunk stable. So they are postural muscles and they work along with the spine to keep you upright. And so when we take the pressure off the spine, so just as we, we said before, if we take the pressure off the spine and put it through our arms, our ab muscles, again right there, don't need to work nearly as hard to keep us upright. So this means they can do something kind of neat. They can do, it's really what we call abdominal breathing, you know, this is kind of a widely known thing, but they can allow laxity and come down this way. So when I breathe in, the, the diaphragm is descending. That's, again, that guy right there. Diaphragm wants to descend. If the guts are in the way, or they're always going to be in the way, but if they are resistant to that diaphragm, we can't get as deep a breath in. So those abdominal muscles, if they relax and let go, let those organs come forward a little bit, we can breathe in much deeper. So we get more of an inhalation here. No, sorry, yeah, no, this is exhalation. Sorry, I got it backwards, ah, okay. So anyways, we uh, we get out bedging this way, ignore everything I said, and we get more of a thoracic opening here. So that's that's good, we want that. When, however, we want more of an exhalation as we're dropping down into it, we've got, again, freedom of contraction of those abdominal muscles, and we can essentially resist the organs from falling forward. We can resist those abdominal organs from falling forward and push the respiratory diaphragm up from the inside. Again, this is, it's all internal workings. You don't need to know the names. But just understand that if I can generate pressure internally, I have an effect on that respiratory diaphragm and that will push the lungs up or allow them to drop down better, getting better inhalation and exhalation simply by muscular relaxation alone. If we have that, we're doing a heck of a lot better. So this is good. Now, I just want to compare it. If you look at our hands on head posture, you'll notice that the ab muscles here they're on stretch, so they would be getting pulled apart like so. So they are, they're getting pulled apart because we're lengthening that trunk. Again, we're holding this position. The thing about skeletal muscles that you have to understand is when you lengthen them, you heighten their tone. They want to contract a little bit harder. So it's very hard to get a full deep abdominal breath when you're in this big extended position. If you're in a big extended position, the abs are being pulled apart 
and the muscle spindles activate. And it will mean that as you breathe in and your guts try to fall forward, you simply can't pouch out. There, you've reached the maximum length of that muscle or at least close to right away. So this hands above the head posture is, is still limiting in the abdominal area for a big abdominal breath. And so this hands on knees posture actually rids us of that. We can get some of the benefits of the shoulders and the arm relations. We can get a pretty decent extended position and then we can allow those guts to fall forward, to come forward like that and relax the ab abdomen to do that. And this is really good. Another thing that happens is, you know, this gets a crazy complicated, but we have our pelvis motion that factors into this too. It's rocking back and forward. So I, I have added to, to the picture, basically just in a really simple way, the pelvis will go backwards and forwards as we inhale and exhale, because it is free swinging essentially. So this is a pelvis from the front view. And these are synovial joints. They're fluid-based joints right here. That's a hip joint and that's a hip joint. And so it means that the pelvis, this whole thing right there, is kind of floating. And especially so because our hands, again, are taking on the weight of our upper body. So we freed up some of the weight that would normally be here. Normally in a standing position or an extended position, the hands on head, this pelvis would be carrying all of the weight so those joints would be a little more compressed and those muscles would be a little bit more toned but when we take that away we don't have that we get a free swing motion of that pelvis and so we get that backwards forwards thing going on again this seems like nothing you know if, if you know you've never heard of this before but that pelvis motion swinging back and forward actually creates a stable base for the body so you'll notice in the flex position where we're exhaling, the pelvis does what we call a posterior tilt. It kind of comes back this way. And when we're in our extended position, I'm just going to chop that off, pelvis does uh, what we call an anterior tilt. So it, it's dropping down in the front or coming up in the back. You don't need to know the technical names to understand how it works. And so don't don't really worry about that too much. But we get the pelvis changing position. So when it goes into flexion, especially, uh, what it does as it drops back, it creates more of a stable base. So it creates a stable base through the what we call the pelvic diaphragm, which is a, a muscular swing that uh, holds the organs in place. You know, like bladder and rectum and and those ones, the urinary defecation and uterus, if you have one. And so it holds it in place. So it prevents things from dropping down. So those organs, those gut organs, those abdominal organs that we said were important in creating pressure towards the diaphragm are more supported. So our exhalations are better as well. So that comes as a factor, an important factor in getting a breath out. That's what we want. These are, these are all highly beneficial things. And so ultimately these, you know, relatively simple biomechanics, very normal ones, um, which are very small and, and you don't really see them unless you're, you're looking for them, but they are ultimately important into achieving a much better breathing apparatus, a much better recovery breath system. In any case, hope you enjoyed that. Again, this is Simple Lines Anatomy. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. We've got lots more similar explanations like this. And if you are interested in learning more anatomy, musculoskeletal anatomy specifically, we do have an app by the same name for iPhone and Android. Oh, lovely. iPhone. There we go. Okay. iPhone and Android. Always spell check, okay? Thank you.